Amen. Amen. With our confidence in Christ alone, our faith in Him, please open up God's Word with me to Ephesians, the second chapter. The second chapter of Ephesians, we're looking at verses 14 through 16, and today we'll be looking at the state of our union. Not the United States of America, but the church, our Savior's church, the state of our union from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. It was around the year 1991 that uh, the late President Ronald Reagan stood before an East Berlin crowd, and during his speech, he urges Mikhail Gorbachev, or Gorbachev, uh, then the leader of the Soviet Union, with these words, and he said, Mr. Gorbachev, uh, tear down this wall. That wall was the wall separating Germany, formerly one nation, uh, into East and West Germany. And of course, we do know, historically speaking, that the tearing down of the wall began in 1989, uh, when the leaders began to open up opportunities for people to migrate to and from East and West Germany. But it was almost 40 years where this, this nation... Uh, Germany was divided. It was a very simple wall built by hands, but that wall, as simple as it was, is a microcosm or it is a model of how division can grow so easily among us. And that is ever more present in our text in Ephesians chapter 2. And it is also fitting for the conflict that we see in our world today and even in the local churches and the church at large. But it was, as you look at Ephesians chapter 2, for several centuries, it was a rift in society between the Jews and between the nations. Before the coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the Jews and the nations were in a generational hostility, thousands of years of separation, aliens and hatred between each other, generations of alienation and hatred. But Christ Jesus, in one sovereign act of the Father's will, ends that hostility once and for all. Of course, naturally, and in light of our time, and the ongoing struggle over unity and reconciliation, we're asking, is that true today? Is that unity and reconciliation true today? Did that work of Christ almost 2,000 years ago transcend time and into eternity? Or do we believe that churches are not positionally in a place of total reconciliation? Well, to begin answering that question, we must first of all affirm what Scripture says. And then we have to look at this from two angles or two sides of the same coin. But our starting point must always be with the head of that coin, and that head is the Lord Jesus Christ because he's the head of the church. Now, therefore, because of Christ, who is the head, who is truly God and truly man, the church, yes, the church of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, is perfectly reconciled and is in perfect union. Perfectly reconciled and in perfect union. All hostility ends when sinners are in union with the Lord Jesus Christ. All hostility ends and all bitterness ends when you are in union with Christ. So that is the side that we must always begin with. We, we have the habit or can have the habit of beginning with ourselves. And we begin to compare ourselves instead of letting the Word of God compare and analyze us. Then we look at the world around us and we say, well, things are not as they should be. Instead of looking at the script and saying things are exactly how God has ordained according to his head, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then we have to look at the other, sign of the other side of the coin. The other side of the coin is still in the refinery. So you have a finished product in Christ. You have an unfinished product in the saints. Because the church consists of sinners redeemed by the grace of God, reconciled through the cross of Christ. But that side, how we display unity and reconciliation is an ongoing work. It is under construction. It is under review, under refining, under transformation. It is where we confront those sins, confess those sins, comply to the Scripture, die to those sins. So what you cannot do is review reconciliation in your life by how you're living according to it. 
to determine whether or not we have been reconciled to God and there's unity in the body of Christ. If you begin with the Catholic Church that is all the redeemed who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, if you begin there in that place, you're not beginning where God began. In fact, where God began when it comes to humanity is humanity's sin. Where God begins with Christ is the Savior's redemptive work. And so if you do not begin there with Christ, you will always end up in the wrong place. Furthermore, you do not begin with the churches all over the world. Listen, we know this. Our little church is overwhelming enough. We have enough problems on our hands. And you say, well, how is that possible? We're a nice church. Well, the reason why we have problems is because you are here. I love you, but you are here. And the moment you came in is a moment you added to the already existing problems of indwelling sin in the process of sanctification. So your little church is overwhelming enough. So listen, beloved, don't begin with the churches all over the world. It says the churches all over the world are not living in unity and being reconciled. No, take inventory of your life. Take inventory of your life within the fellowship. And that equation is simple, and is, it is the best equation. Take inventory in how you live with each other and for each other in Christ. You hear that, beloved? How you live with each other, how you live together, but how you're also living for each other in Christ. Uh, take inventory in how you love the people you worship with. How are you encouraging them to be more like Christ? How you are building genuine friendships in Christ with them? That is how you should look at unity and reconciliation in the local fellowship. And then let that spread and bud out to the community and the world around us. Let me set out a principle. Practically, we are mortifying the consequences of our former hostility. That is a principle, and that is true. Practically, we are mortifying the consequences of our former hostility by living in the unity that God ordained and Christ achieved. So we're mortifying the consequences of our former hostility by living in the unity that God ordained and Christ achieved. And how do we live in that unity? By emulating Christ by the Spirit of God by emulating Christ. And so within the local body of believers, a local church, and this is where we're looking at the state of our union. Within the local church, we fellowship and worship with each other in the power of Christ through the Holy Spirit. Now, you know, last week, the name for Christ, peace, is why the reconciling of sinners to God and each other has eternal and final significance. We looked at that in verse 14, for he himself is our peace. And in back before then, in verses 11 through 13, the Gentile readers in, in Ephesus received a history lesson on their spiritual demise prior to salvation. And those verses 11 through 13 are parallel with verses 1 through 10 of chapter 2. For chap verses 1 through 10 to chapter 2, the first few verses, the first three verses, we find our predicament in sin, our estrangement from God, our spiritual death, under the very powers of the ruler of this age, who is Satan. But then also in verses 4 through 10, you find the joy of salvation and the grace of God. And verses 4 through 10 are parallel with, with verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And so it was a dark time in our lives and sin, death and separation from God before the great and holy invasion of our utter sin and death by our gracious God. And now today, Christ, who is your peace, says this. He says, it is finished to disunity and hostility. That's right, beloved. Christ says, it is finished. Disunity and hostility has ended. The people who redeems live in harmony together in Christ. But we must understand and recognize how this is possible, why it is possible, and why it is even achievable in the life of the church. It begins with what Christ has done. So in verses 14 through 16, God's Word reveals that Christ, as peace, completes our union and reconciliation. 
that Christ as peace completes our union and reconciliation. Well, why would we even say the word complete? Well, just look at the language in verses 14 through 16. Let me read it. It says, verse 14 of Ephesians 2, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one. Now listen, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, verse 15, by abolishing, abolishing, completing, beloved, the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace. Verse 16, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, listen, thereby killing the hostility. There's nothing mild here about what Christ has accomplished. It's been achieved once and for all. And of course, you look at the end of verse 15 and then verse 16, you actually have two joined purpose clauses that reminds and refreshes our thoughts on what Christ has accomplished in creating in himself, but also reconciling us both to God. Well, beloved, I want us to look at verse 14 and notice that Christ achieves unity. That Christ achieves unity. And notice that the distinct work of Christ mentioned here, that Christ, as, as our peace, right, that he himself has made us both one. He has made us both one, and God through Christ reconciled us to himself and to each other by uniting us to Christ, through Christ, and in Christ. It is to Christ, through Christ, and in Christ. So, beloved, you have dead sinners here raised to new life, given a new identity in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ unites uh, two hostile people together. And so here you have in this text hostile sinners and enmity with God and each other. They're now reconciled sinners at peace with God and each other. We must begin there. We can always ask our questions, why are we not living this out? But we cannot ask the question, why is this not working? It is working. It is working. It's at work presently. It will always work because Christ has done this. He has made us both one. And so when you look at the sacrifice of Christ, it destroys two obstacles. It destroys disunity and division. It destroys disunity and division. Christ achieves this, and Christ alone achieves it. It must begin with the work of our Savior. I mentioned this earlier. We can always ask the question why it is not in effect in our lives, but we must not ask the question at all, is it working? It is working because Christ has done it. Christ disarmed the unity, this disunity. But I want us to move on to the second complete work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In uniting us and, and bringing us together as one, this final work by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, secondly, Christ abolishes hostility. Christ abolishes hostility. And this section is meaty because it is the end of verse uh, 14 in the beginning of verse 15 of Ephesians 2, we can say that Christ abolishes ethnic hostility. Of course, I'm using present tense terms because it is a past work with continuing results today. He abolishes hostility. And do remember that this hostility was the chief and the most epic of hostilities. There will never be one like it. There will never be a hostility like this one. But Christ abolishes hostility. It says this in the end of verse 14, And Christ, who made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Now here the word for dividing wall is found only in 
the New Testament, uh, this particular passage, it is found only here in the New Testament. It is really uncommon in, in Greek writings, but when you are thinking of a wall here, it's a par- partition. Uh, it, it separates, for example, a room or a temple. So the dividing wall here is either the literal wall or the, the visible wall was a symbol of separation. And of course, verse 15 will explain and let us know that the visible wall was a physical, and it was a real wall, it, there was a real wall that divided the two. But that wall will become a symbol of division between two groups. And so the Gentiles, the non-Jewish people, if they believed in Yahweh, as proselytes it would be called, there will be Gentile converts who converted to Judaism. There were at least two major divisions in the temple. There'll be the outer court and the inner court. The Gentiles were not allowed access into the inner court. In fact, there were signs placed before the entrance of the inner court in Latin and in Greek, forbidden Gentile worshipers from entering the inner court. And to that extent, the Roman law would give permission to the Jews to kill any Gentile who would cross that threshold. No Gentile had access to the inner court, and the warning signs were were there clearly. If you do pass this threshold, you will be put to death. And so this literal wall was there. You may remember in Acts, the 21st chapter, Acts chapter 21, verses 20 through 29, that they would accuse the Apostle Paul of bringing Greeks into the temple. And they said that Paul has defiled the temple, this holy place. Luke records in that section, in that inspired narrative, that they had previously seen uh, Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, with Paul in the city, and they supposed or assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple. So you have here in Acts, you have an Ephesian citizen who had first-hand experience of what it means to cross the threshold, even though he did not do so. The Jews were so adamant about crossing that into the inner court. But as we know, a physical wall is also symbolic. The wall as a symbol, in fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, is transformed here as a reference, I believe, to the law. And verse 15 verifies that. In essence, it was the law that divided the nations and fostered hostility because of sin. Now, we do know a scripture in Galatians 3.24, for example, that the law is a tutor that leads us to Christ. We know that the law reveals the nature of God and His expectations for His created people. But the law, because of our sin, increases our transgression. Do we not think it did the very same thing for the Jews? It exposes our transgressions, and we have more sin in us than we would have known had it not been for the law. Now, listen to what the law of God or the testimony of our God's word says. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And so we know that if the law works on the heart effectively, it is also a testimony that gives wisdom to those who do not know. But as history proves to us, the Jews did not grow in wisdom. They grew in pride, and they would withdraw from the nations, not according to the law. They did not obey the law, but they would withdraw from the nations in an attitude of superiority. Now, think about the law and the people of God, right? Think about the law and in the, their pride and in the, uh, their arrogance under the law. Think about that and think of how Romans describes the problem the law holds over the condemned, right? You have what you may call those who want to abide by the law, but they cannot. Um, it was a commentator, Douglas Moo, who believed that Romans chapter 7 is, is not dealing with indwelling sin, but actually it is, it is a picture of Israel's struggle with the law and their sin. That conclusion is a stretch, but just notice what happens when anyone applies the law, and the nation of Israel applying the law, as they did, the law did nothing different to the Jews. 
It did nothing different to the life of the Jews as it would do to the other nations. It was not that they would blend in with society. The problem appears to be that the Jews were looking down on other nations and using the law in doing so. They were using the law of God to despise other nations. They did not love them with compassion. They took the law and used it as a justification to hate unclean nations. So the law, instead of becoming a terror and fear because of sin, it was sharpened to inflict condemnation on the nations with no hope of redemption for them. So as you think about that, it would take nothing more than the miraculous work of Christ to undo centuries of hatred, indifference, ridicule, to open not only the door for the nations to hear, but to dismantle their bitterness, to dismantle the bitterness of the Gentiles in that time to receive the gospel from their enemies. Oh, beloved, if Christ saves a church murderer to preach to the same people he once afflicted and opens their heart to believe in the former killer, why do we think it is impossible today for God to do a great work of fleshing out the beauty of reconciliation even in our times? That God will use your former enemies or even your enemies to declare the gospel to you and save you and redeem you. That God through his son, Jesus Christ, will take the Gentiles fresh off of the Jewish hostility, who would use the very same principles in the law of God to abuse the Gentiles and to accuse the Gentiles and to hate the Gentiles and to justify their hatred for the Gentiles. Will through the same nation of Israel preach the glad tidings of his son, Jesus Christ. This is the work of God. It is miraculous. The hostility in this text, nothing surpasses it when you think about these implications. How is it possible for us to listen to those who may have persecuted us? How is it possible for us to listen to their ancestors declare the gospel and to display the love of Christ to us? It is because this is what God does. When he abolishes ethnic hostility. Now the reason we can hear the message of the gospel is not that we get over these moments emotionally. The reason is the body of Christ is sufficient. The body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in calling sinners into salvation is sufficient to disarm the hatred and instill love and unity. Beloved, look at our text. The power of God is on display. Christ has broken down that wall, the wall that the Jews would justify and vilify the Gentiles. Instead of using the law, they would misuse the law. Instead of using the law, they would abuse the law and use it to accomplish their selfish and sin-filled motives. Does that sound familiar? But God still through the Jews, preaches the gospel of his son, tears down those walls and unites hostile people together and the hostility ends in Christ because Christ totally and finally removed the enmity. Where? Through negotiations? Beloved, it says in verse 14, look at God's word, and broken down where in his flesh. And notice this, beloved, the enmity here, okay, the hostility here in verse 14 is not a general one. It is specific. The hostility is toward people. It was real. It was present. It was alive in the hearts of people who were dead in their sin. It is toward, directed toward fellow humanity, and it was done in his flesh or in his body. And so it is true that the Jews were at war with the Gentiles and the Gentiles were at war with the Jews. 
the Jews who were idolatrous and the Gentiles who were idolatrous, worshiping kings, the leaders, false gods, the Jews worshiping their superiority. You remember in Acts chapter 19, verse 19, that's an easy one to remember, right? Acts 19, 19, that the believers in Ephesus had remnants of idols. They were practicing magic arts. Uh, sources will tell us that the people were curious about their future. Or they wanted security from their enemies or protection from anyone who would oppose them. And they would use the magic arts to help them with incantations, with chants toward their idols, or even making oaths. They were a desperate people who needed to be freed from those idolatrous lies and myths. But the Jews were no different. Both groups needed God's work to invade their wickedness and idolatry. And it says so that Christ brought them near. And beloved, Christ is doing that today. We're not ignoring the news. We're not ignoring what we're seeing. But we're beginning with what God has done with Christ. The problem is not redemption. The problem is our reaction in response to redemption. But Christ has done it once and for all. Brought us near. Listen, beloved. Christ fully and totally absolved all cultural and religious hostility. Christ fully and totally absolved all cultural and religious hostility. From diet to days, from regulations and worship, uh, from our cultural differences, he fully absolved them all. He fully absolved them all. And so whenever we think about the impossibility, it seems, to take God's word and misuse it, and misuse the law of God, the word of God, the principles from God. When we think it's impossible to do so, history says otherwise, and Ephesians says the same. Because with proof, the word of God reminds us that man will take God's good law, and it becomes a gross distraction. And they will say that everyone needs the word of God except for me. Even now, in Christ, we devise ways to stir up bottom-dwelling deposits of hostility, using God's word to do so. But beloved, when the soul sits in the presence of Christ, the presence of the cross, faith in the cross, and their feet in the footsteps of Christ, all is well because of Christ. Listen, beloved, if you're in Christ, this is what we're singing. This is what we're saying. In Christ... Listen carefully, beloved. Nothing is left for fallen humanity to reconcile or repair. Nothing. We cannot reconcile anything. We can't even reconcile our budget sometimes. How can we reconcile fallen humanity? We cannot reconcile ourselves. Christ left nothing to humanity to reconcile or repair. He has done it. Think about it this way, according to the text. He did this in his flesh, which means that the death of the Savior was the death to hostility. The death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was the death to all hostility. When Christ said these words, it is finished, it marked the end of enmity, the end of strife between believing humanity, and listen, between believing humanity and their God. And between fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the most historic of all earthly hostilities. The one between the Jews and the Gentiles. It became history. In the historical advent and sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Why? Verse 15. Our Savior abolished. Look at this, beloved. Look at God's word. We're having open heart surgery. We want to look at as many words as we can, and we're going to do open heart surgery, and we're not going to sedate the saint. You need to feel the pain and the joy of what God has done. And if you are, if you are inducing hostility, if you're regurgitating hostility, if you're bringing up past hostilities, I pray that you will not fail to see that it is all absolved in the body of Christ and his sacrifice. This is what he's done by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Ordinances. 
This could have been multiple commands here that were included in the law. Or ordinances could be the ceremonial demands of the law. Many of them you find in Exodus. What the saints needed to do to maintain their fellowship with God and the sacrifices and also the prohibitions that God set out for them to be a pure community. But what you have here in this text, beloved, is the disarming and the ending of the entire economy of the Mosaic Law. From the commands to the ceremony. Nothing, nothing in the Mosaic law is transferable. It's all done away with. Now, is the text throwing out God's moral law? What about God's moral law, what was included in the Mosaic law? Well, let us answer it by saying that God's law, beloved, or his moral law did not originate from the Mosaic law. What is eternally bound in the character of God is always untouched. But the entire system, including the laws associated with him, the Mosaic system, Christ abolished the entire structure in his flesh. Because the nature of God, his attributes, are always a part of his revelation, but it never began with Moses, it began with Adam. So Christ abolished the entire structure in his flesh. Well, why was this necessary, beloved? Because of fallen humanity, God gives us something good, and we just find ways to ruin it. We're in a great country of America, a great country with great sins, great blessings with great depravity. Why? Because of God's mercy and our misery. There you go. And we find ways to tear it up. We find ways to ruin it. Because we're angry, no, because we're sinful. So God gives us the law. Here it is, God's holy, gracious, merciful law. He gives it to us, and we will dismantle it, turn it upside down, flip it around. I mean, even the saints would have testimonies of God's goodness to them, and they'll be cursing at other saints. Ever heard those testimonies before? I've heard them. They will give thanks to God for their enemies who were in attendance that evening. We will use God's law, God's goodness, and manipulate it. Our heart is incurably sick without Christ. So it was necessary because the law became a hindrance. And it was always a hindrance to full access to God. The Gentiles could not have full access to God the way the current system, the Mosaic system, was structured. And you know what? The Jews made sure that Gentiles knew that you were second-rate citizens, second-class citizens. You're below us. You're worthy of death and not life. And they did so, the Jews did so through the Mosaic system. Do you remember what Paul calls the Mosaic law and that economy? The Sinaitic covenant, he calls it the ministry of death. And the Jews were boasting about the ministry of death. Listen, beloved, what is true then is true now. Christ did not come to modify the ministry of death. He came to mortify the ministry of death, and he did. And that is what verse 15 demands for us to believe, that there's no partnership between the Mosaic law and Christ. Christ came to abolish it. Now, the word abolish. When anything is abolished, it is no longer effective and loses its power and influence. It is no longer effective and loses its power and influence. Now, some would say, well, destruction or abolishing is a strong word to refer to the Mosaic Covenant because the Word of God says it is glorious in its own right. So maybe we should go with canceling, or voiding, or nullifying. Those are very neat options. But other passages indicate the strongest sense possible. When you compare the Old Covenant to the New Covenant in Christ. So abolishing is not too strong of a word. In fact, that same word for abolish is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28, where God chose the law and despised in the world, even the things that are not in 1 Corinthians 1, 28, to bring to what? To adjust them? To edit them? To bring to nothing the things that are. So this Mosaic law 
It was abolished. Every legal aspect of it, every condemning aspect of the law was done away with. And we don't need to rescue the Ten Commandments or most of the Ten Commandments because those commandments are wrapped up in, in God's moral expectations based on who He is and our relationship to Him and also to each other. Christ brings that into fulfillment and into fruition in our lives. Christ points us to our relationship to the Father and to each other. That is something to think about, dear saints. That if we harbor animosity and unforgiveness and hatred toward each other, we're living in the old economy of the Mosaic law of condemnation than that of the new covenant of justification. Oh, beloved, listen. As adopted children, it changes. The law no longer stands. But listen to this. When you consider what God has done in Christ Jesus, the new regulations for us is the law of Christ. The law of Christ. And what is abolished is whatever regulations in the Mosaic Mosaic law that would exclude the Gentiles from worship, but also condemn the Jews for their lack of appropriating that of the law of God. So what law do we have? We have the law of Christ. Ephesians chapter 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The new law is the law of Christ, and we all have access to the Father because of Christ. We have the fullness of unity, harmony, love, peace, joy, and sanctification, and the future glorification. And we live according to the law of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is the law that we're under. And let me set before you, beloved, what I would call a banquet of blessings. When the, the hostility has been brought to an end in Christ. First of all, your life is now under Christ for his glory in the gospel. Your life is now under Christ for his glory in the gospel. An illustration of that is 1 Corinthians chapter 9. The apostle Paul uses his life as, as an illustration on how to use your liberties for the benefit of the gospel. But then also when he said so, he speaks of the law of Christ. He says, to those outside the law, of course, not lawless people, but Gentiles, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. So his life is under Christ for the glory of Christ and the gospel. He's not bound to the Mosaic law as some of it in his nationality are, and they're still in condemnation because of it. But he's not lawless and free to do as he pleases because the law of Christ is there. But there's also another benefit here, and it is that you have the joy of Christ. And in the joy of Christ is the joy of submission to the law of Christ. There's something glorious. There's something beautiful and marvelous. Another benefit is that the old covenant is dim in comparison to the new covenant. The old covenant is dim in comparison to the new covenant. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, Now if the ministry of death carved in letters on stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze in Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Indeed, in this case, What once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. The old covenant is dim in comparison to the new. And then we look at it fourthly, another one here is this. We can change because God writes his law in our hearts. In the abolishing of this hostility, we have a heart of flesh. According to Jeremiah 31, 33 through 34, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. There's something to consider when we look at another bounty and it is beloved this, you serve the end of all things. Christ. You serve the end of all things, Christ. Remember, the Father's plan, which he's made known to us, is to unite all things in Christ. 
this, I think, makes our fights simple and easy. What are you fighting for? You're fighting in the power of the Spirit of God, what the Father is doing to unite all things in His Son. That's it. To unite all things in His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is in the abolishing of ethnic hostility, that we no longer live for ourselves. You see, many of the one another passages in Scripture reminds us that our life is for Christ and for each other. It is not for ourselves. It is for the glory of God because God has ordained before the foundation of the world, beloved creation. It's not for us. In fact, the future glory is not for us. It's for Christ. It's for the Savior. You say, well, that's not what I heard from the preacher three years ago. The preacher lied to you. The plan, even in light of the fall, the fall of man and man's rebellion fits into God's plan perfectly to redeem a people for his son, a kingdom where righteousness dwells for his son. So the abolishing of ethnic hostility is for the Son of God and ultimately for the glory of the Father. What role do you play in it? You give God thanks. That's your role. You give God thanks for His goodness in granting you the blessing of being a part of this eternal joy as opposed to the eternal damnation in hell. That should be sufficient enough. Beloved, yes, Christ is the plan. Christ is the aim, beloved. Christ is the goal. Saints, Christ is the culmination. If he is, then it is only right for the chosen one in whom all things will find its yes and amen to be the author of your salvation. And the text says that he is the law and its indictment upon us, condemning us, our Savior, nail it to the cross, and he abolishes hostility. So when your Savior abolished the hostility, he crucified the rough paths you would face. He mortified the living enmity, and he set us all on the same level place beneath his cross in abolishing ethnic hostility. So Christ achieves our unity in verse 14, and then at the end of verse 14, in the first half of verse 15, he abolishes our ethnic hostility. And then thirdly, Christ creates a new humanity. And notice here, as you look at this text, translation is faithful in saying that, or in others it may say so that, and I think so that is probably the better approach. And that, that phrase and that idea of so that in verse 15 and 16, those are purpose clauses or purpose statements. Beloved, that is a purpose, that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two. You see this? One new man in the place of two, in the body of Christ, his sacrifice, and we become the body of Christ, the risen Christ. So, beloved, this is for Christ and for God, but it leads to the saints' highest good. Your highest good is to be a new creation in Christ and to be reconciled to God. The word create here means to bring something to life that was never there before. We believe that this is the dawning of the church. This body is the body of Christ, the church under the new covenant. I'm not here to argue about the church being in the Old Testament times. I can't argue that as much as I can say definitively that this is referring to the church in the New Testament era, and there was nothing like it before. It didn't say that he modified the Old Testament church. He says he created. That's significant. Because that same principle is that the God who created men from the dust of the earth creates a new people and unites them together in his son. This was never done before. A people in Christ a new creation in Christ. We are one. Now, I said you have an open, open heart surgery. The doctor usually takes a very long time, and he does a lot along the way. So, yeah, there may be a lot of points, a lot of outlines, a lot of sub-points 
Because here we are as Christians, we're paying, playing holy hopscotch. We're evading the main topics. We refuse to dig deep into the text of Scripture. And yes, we need to nail our sins to the cross as Christ did. We keep resurrecting sins that don't exist because Christ has mortified them. And the reason why I say that they don't exist is that we are resurrecting the sins that Christ died for. And instead of looking at our own hearts, we're saying that Christ's work wasn't sufficient. We may not say that directly, but by implication, when we say that we don't have reconciliation, when we say that we don't have unity, we're saying that Christ's work is not sufficient. I want to make it emphatically clear, and as dogmatic as the text allows me to, that it is finished. And so should our discussions be about lack of reconciliation, lack of unity. In our local churches, that is my big question, Grace Community Church of Long Beach. What are we doing about what Christ has done? We need to be concerned about the world, yes, but we certainly need to look at ourselves. We need to look at ourselves. Look at these benefits, beloved. We have equal access to God in worship and fellowship with each other. We have equal access to God in worship and in fellowship with each other. Equal access to God in worship and fellowship with each other. Number two, we have a singular distinction in a Savior who rules as king over all differences. We have a singular distinction in a Savior who rules as king over all differences. One distinction. What does that win Christ? And it rules over all of our differences. Well, you know, not everyone's doing that. You know, passing my heart breaks because the world is not doing it, but are you doing it? Are you pursuing it? Are you making sure that you're relentless? We don't pursue each other enough sometimes. I don't know if they like me so. Have you tried? Have you pursued each other? Yeah, but every time I do it, I get rejected. Yes, our Savior was despised and rejected. Join the club. We have a singular distinction in a Savior who rules as king over all differences. Thirdly, we all partake of the same Christ and are in the same body. We all partake of the same Christ are and are in the same body. Number four, we are in a redeemed society, united in and through the Son of God. We are in a redeemed society, united in and through the Son of God. The fifth one, too, is very important. This is not a classless society as much as it is an exclusive one. It is an exclusive society. We belong exclusively to the Savior. Our class, our recognition, it is in Him. Therefore, if we're all one in Him, we should all be seeing each other in the same light, the light of Christ. There are no special saints no second-class saints, we're all in him. We belong to him. We live in his life. We walk in his light. He loves, he, we love because he loves. We are united because the triune God are in perfect unity of fellowship and love. And it says it clear, beloved, it says in himself, right, that he might create in himself. Notice the location where this takes place, this happens. In himself, so he might create in himself one new man. In the place of two. And when you think about this, remember the power of our Savior, right? That the power of our God in raising our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, our Savior has as a risen Savior the same power. The church has been empowered also because Christ is the head. So we have no excuse for not living in the, the fullness of these blessings. Beloved, in fact, this idea of in himself is extremely emphatic in the original. That is where the creative act comes to life. It is a place where hostility ends. It is a place where he creates the, the new humanity as church. And it is the place where we flourish as his bride. That one new man is presently seen in the church. So the end of all hostility and the beginning of reconciliation comes in and through Christ alone. 
So how should we think about this? Well, this is the Bible's resolution, beloved, to the state of our union. This is the biblical resolution. As a people in Christ, the church is the display to the powers how the Savior unites sinners. We're on display before the powers how Christ unites sinners. How significant is that? Think about it. Rebellious sinners. Wicked sinners. Violent sinners. Dead in the trespasses sinners. Now consider this. Through Christ, our God brings the most rebellious part of creation into subjection. Have you ever thought about that? That the most rebellious part of creation is humanity? It is humanity. We are the most perverted. What, what should be natural to us, we pervert. We call good evil and evil good. Humanity is the most rebellious out of God's creation. Our Savior didn't start with these. He didn't start with a goldfish. He starts with rebellious humanity. The most rebellious of his creation. Beloved, we are the most rebellious of God's created things. And those are the ones he calls to salvation and into his body. That he unites us and equips us to grow together in love, according to Ephesians chapter 4. My beloved, where should we see the signs of this new humanity? As I said before, this is surgery and so important. I make no apologies for giving you too much. But I'm truly sorry when I don't give you enough. Because this is so critical for us. If we don't have a Christocentric view of reconciliation and unity... We, we soon will all be woke people and still not awake. Because wokeism is a lie. It's a misrepresentation of, of what it means to understand biblical reconciliation and unity. And just remember that these movements usually originate from people who do not believe in the inspiration of Scripture. So go figure. Let me give you biblical principles. And I'm saying this on concrete certain terms that none of us are living up to. But once again, I'm giving you the Christocentric view. To be truly in Christ is to fully embrace one another. To be truly in Christ is to fully embrace one another. To be truly in Christ is to faithfully engage each other. Fully embrace one another, faithfully engage each other, to be truly in Christ is to firmly embrace one another. So you have fully embrace one another, faithfully engage one another, firmly embrace one another. And number four, to be truly in Christ is to publicly affirm each other. It's to publicly affirm each other. There's embracing, the affirmation, the affirming, fully, faithfully, firmly, publicly. Because these are signs of those who no longer have hostility toward each other because they are reconciled to God and to each other. Saints, brothers and sisters, if you are partial toward each other, you are making a grave mistake. It doesn't matter who it is. The sin of partiality is natural to every human being. Every person. The reason why I say it, to be truly in Christ is not that you're saved or not saved, but to be truly in Christ is submit daily to his rule, to his leading, to his lordship by the spirit of God and his word. That's it unconditionally. It's not about your feelings. And if a pastor ever tells you, go with your heart or your feelings, run. Those old saints used to do back in the day, right, when they had to leave early, hands up in the air, feet out on the ground. And in the air, feet on the ground, they're gone. Those are those early holy saints who had to beat the traffic home. If that preacher 
does not remind you that in salvation is to fully embrace everything who Christ says and to do, do so joyfully because you have the joy of the Lord in you, you ought not to be there. This is not a season for us to be emotional saints. You can have emotions, but that's a roller coaster. As you're riding those emotional waves, open up the Word of God and be devotional and calm your soul down. There's so much of that going on right now. And when we do so, we abandon the Scripture's truth claims concerning Christ. That to be truly in Christ is to fully embrace one another, to faithfully engage with each other, to firmly embrace one another, and to publicly affirm each other. And we are supposed to practice. That's the part. The other side of the coin is practicing it. The problem with the church is the practice, not the power, the practice. And then we want to save the world and change the world when this is for the local congregation in Ephesus to practice. There's no hostility. The text says, so making peace. No hostility, no rivalry, no animosity, no bitterness. Now, I'm not saying that you are not hostile at times because of your own sin. I'm not saying that you're not sinfully angry at times. Ephesians will tell us to be angry and do not sin. I'm not saying that at times you may be sinfully competitive or bitter. What I'm saying that in Christ, that is no longer a badge of honor. That is not a part of the dynamic of the new humanity in Christ. Notice this here too. And it says that he might create in verse 15, if you notice in the text, beloved, this is a divine action. It is a continuing action from a divine source. It is a continuing action. Action that he might create is continuous. He has done it. He continues to do so. So there are no limits to that, that work of making. And the result, beloved, is peace, harmony. The result of a new humanity in Christ is peace between hostile ethnicities. The one new man is nothing other than the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, uniquely living together in peace, in harmony. Because that is our Savior's new humanity. Number four, Christ as peace completes our union and reconciliation because Christ reconciles you to God. Christ reconciles you to God. And it says in verse 16, And it might reconcile us to God in one body through the cross, thereby, what? Killing Notice the words here, beloved, killing the hostility. And take careful note, these are inspired gems here in the Word of God, beloved. Look at the text of Scripture as we just analyze uh, with submission to the Word of God. Not criticize, but analyze for the sake of our nourishment. This this idea here of of the word creating and reconciling, listen to beloved, the Greek text places them within a relationship. So right now, where you have one, you have the other, and might create and might reconcile are partners in God's work of redemption. So wherever you have one in creating, you have the other in reconciling. In creating this this one new man, you have reconciled sinners to God. So whatever strife or conflict between humanity and, and its creator is ended. And in this body, we're united. So our division and divisiveness, that has ended. You don't have one without the other. Both events are in relationship. So a new creation in Christ are reconciled to God. The new creation in Christ, they are reconciled to God. So this conflict is resolved in the Savior in bringing both parties to a position of peace. There's something else that you need to think about, too. When you're looking at this word reconciling, in other passages there's a similar word for reconciling used. In Romans 5, 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, for example, in every case, beloved, God sovereignly reconciles sinners. Are we hearing this, beloved? We can't force reconciliation. We can't make it. God sovereignly reconciles us. We receive this gift of reconciliation that, that he gives through Jesus Christ, but this is something we cannot forget. God takes initiative to reconcile sinners because sinners never will, and can never reconcile themselves to God. 
This is glorious for us to remember. This is God's doing. But notice what it says. Reconcile us both to God in one body, his body. This is not a divisive thing. This is clear, beloved. There's one body through one cross, one Savior by our sovereign God. The cross of Christ, listen, marks the end of hostility between repentant sinners and God. It is the end of it. So both Jews and Gentiles who are in Christ are now at peace when they repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say this carefully and prayerfully that many people, including believers, are saying that we want peace. But that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says we have peace. There is a difference between that and the experience of it, the enjoyment of it, but that's something we must do personally and corporately, living in that peace, enjoying that peace. They say that we we want reconciliation. They say, that's all I want is reconciliation, and they they really look genuine and earnest, but that's, that's wrong. We have reconciliation. This is what we're doing today. We're leaving the ground of reconciliation, the Lord Jesus Christ, We're making amends based on psychological data and volatile information. No, beloved. It is not statistics that validates unity and reconciliation. It is the cross of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, beloved, and notice what the text says. The place is in the body of our Savior, one body through that cross, the cross, His cross. And now the body consists of Jews and Gentiles, the poor, the rich, formerly neglected, once despised. Yes, formerly oppressed. You may have been a slave, you may be mistreated, you may be even oppressed in this world. The church historically may not have lived up to its billing, but you're reconciled to God. You're still in the body because of what Christ has done. This is glorious, beloved, because you came to the cross, trusting in what God has done, And in doing so, God unites you to Christ and unites us to each other. And it says at the end of verse 16, what does it do? Killing, thereby, killing the hostility. The word for thereby, other translations may say by it. Uh, Some take that word thereby or by it as a reference to Christ himself, and that is true. But it may be better to narrow it to the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on the cross. By virtue of his sacrifice in your place, the substitutionary atonement of our Savior, where he died as your substitute to unite you to the Father. The text says in doing so, he killed it. You must grasp this, beloved, because the meaning and the, and the, uh, the, the understanding here will give you the discernment to know that when other believers deny reconciliation because of false expectations that you will not, Because listen to this, the meaning here, to kill, it destroys both the source and the sign of life. So therefore, whatever the source of that hostility was, that's destroyed. Wherever there are signs of life of that hostility, that's destroyed. Do you see that, beloved? The source, destroyed. The sign of hostility, destroyed. We begin with Christ and we begin there. We recognize that every vestige, every sign of hostility is gone. Completely. In other words, the source dies and there are no more signs of hostility's life. When you look at Christ. You look at yourself, there's plenty. I mean, do we not even have conflict within ourselves? Are we not at odds sometimes within ourselves? You expect the world to get it together when you have not yet? We expect the unbelieving world to recognize the importance of unity and reconciliation when we're still trying to recognize it, even though the scripture says it's done completely, it's dead. And here we are 
fossilizing these things and digging them. It says, no, it, it, it's still there. Now our Savior says, no, the source and the life killed, gone, destroyed once and for all. Yes, it's complete destruction. Listen, beloved, Christ disarmed and destroyed the hostility. And I think the chief hostility was between God and yourself. But because we're enemies of God, we're naturally enemies toward each other. Listen, beloved, reconciliation is no less than the total disarming of every obstacle, the complete destruction of every hindrance that will alter access to God and fellowship with each other. Completely destroyed every hindrance. Anything that would alter your access to God and fellowship with each other has been destroyed. Now, think about this. If you are considering what Christ has done, then, beloved, the state of your union is at rest. The state of your union with Christ and with each other, it is at rest. Because Christ as peace completes our union and our reconciliation by achieving perfect unity, abolishing our ethnic hostility by creating a new humanity and by reconciling you to God. Now, with respect to the fact that there's only one imperative in this section, that one imperative is in verse 13. We know that the doctrine has implications for your future exhortations right in chapter 4, but we've got to get the theology down. We're always running to what? We need to do something. No, pastor, move, go on to chapter 4. We've got to get there soon. We've got to do it. We've got to fix this. No, Christ has fixed it. We've got to get together. We need a rally. We need a pep rally. Do something, preacher. Go to chapter 4. Go to chapter 5. This is spiritual warfare. Go to chapter 6. No, God has done it in Christ. If you don't get the doctrine down, the duty is going to be a bunch of hot nonsense with cold Christians. What warms the heart is doctrine. It's the indicative, what has Christ done so that I may do it in light of what he has done? Because the world is screaming, there's no unity in the church, and we do not see it, but no, it's perfect. It is here. It is absolutely perfect. I see perfect unity. I see perfect reconciliation. I see no problems with what Christ has done. Now, for us to say that there are problems in this one, like, oh, there are problems, oh, yeah. I'm here, you are here, we are here. There were some problems in my way here. Just a simple Sunday worship, there were problems. It's going to be in this world, but the work of Christ is absolutely perfect. This, beloved, is what we need to know. We are equipped by the Spirit's power and the Word of God to apply these doctrines in their richest and glorious forms. Get the doctrine down. You are doing it because Christ has done it. Christ has done it, therefore you are doing it. It is perfect. It is complete. The state of your union is absolutely flawless because of Christ. There are some reflections, and uh, they're on the church app. It's good to look at them and also some application for you to, to think about. I want you to, to engage in them in the church's app, I think also on the website. But look at these things carefully, beloved, because the state of our union is intact. America's union is not, but our Savior's is, and it is glorious. It is wonderful. It is rich. It is marvelous. It is eternal, and it will never, never perish. Amen. Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the wonder of your truth. You're faithless, even you're faithful, that is, when we're faithless because you cannot deny yourself. Your faithfulness is eternal. We must begin with you and then live out these truths in the power of your spirit, not being persuaded by the lies of this world, but by the truth of our gracious God and what he's done in Christ. Amen.